Tamar was born in 1160, just north of her father's capital city of Tbilisi. She was the great-granddaughter of the architect of the Georgian kingdom, named King David the Builder. Her father was the current king of Georgia, fittingly named George III. She was the oldest daughter of George, who only had one more child after Tamar, and her younger sister's name was Rusidan. Their mother was Princess Burdekan of Alania. Burdekan's father was the king of the Alans. The Alans were a powerful kingdom in their own right and controlled large portions of land to the north of Georgia. George III's reign was one of mostly status quo that consisted of a back-and-forth struggle between him and multiple Muslim coalitions led by Elderquiz, the ruler of Azerbaijan. King George met these coalitions with mixed results, winning and losing some battles but mostly keeping his land intact. The first major event that occurred in Tamar's life was when her first cousin attempted to steal the throne from her father in 1177. This cousin, named Denma, would have been the rightful claimant to the throne if his own father, David V, did not revolt against his father in a failed coup. This coup would end with the death of Tamar's uncle, David V, and the family feud would reignite in 1177 when Denma would raise a 30,000 strong army to finish the work that his father had started. In just a few short months, his army would be defeated, and Denma would be captured by his uncle George. This revolt actually helped Tamar, seeing as the rebellion let King George and Tamar see which nobles were against them, and it would also remove Denma, who would have been Tamar's biggest threat to her throne. Dunma would not be murdered, though. No, his punishment was much worse. After his capture, Dunma would have his eyes gouged out, and if this wasn't enough, King George then castrated his own nephew, ensuring that his claim to the throne would die with him. This revolt had shown King George III that his lack of sons could have dire consequences. So in the following year of 1178, he appointed Tamar as his co-ruler, making sure that everybody knew who exactly his successor was. King George III would then live the rest of his reign in relative peace. He would try to institute a meritocracy by appointing men of low birth but of great skill to bureaucratic roles inside the government. For six years, the father and daughter would rule Georgia, and for six more years, the Georgian nobility would question the legitimacy of this future female monarch. If Tamar really did become queen, then she would be the first queen in Georgian history to solely rule over the kingdom. And finally, in 1184, her father, King George III, would die after a mostly quiet but solid 22-year reign. Then in a turn of events, Tamar would not be crowned queen, because she would become a king, a status superior to that of any man who opposed her. The 34-year-old King Tamar remained unmarried and was crowned at a time of intense change in her nobility. Her father's meritocratic government reforms angered the well-established and landed nobles in her realm, who constantly watched as their titles, lands, and wealth were all stripped out from under them and taken by peasants and foreigners. These angered nobles would now take their frustration out on the newly crowned Tamar, who was forced into a few agreements by the nobility who at this point were on the edge of revolt. First, Tamar was forced to abandon the meritocracy that her father had painstakingly tried to construct, being forced to fire men of simple birth and great talent. Secondly, Tamar was forced by her nobles to create a legislative body of noblemen that acted like a house of lords and were responsible for approving and distributing royal decrees. This would lessen Tamar's real power significantly. Lastly, the nobility required the 34-year-old king to marry. The kings of Georgia had traditionally for the most part been great warriors, with this martial culture producing numerous warrior kings. But Tamar was no warrior. The nobles would select their new general to lead them, and they selected a man named Yuri Bogolyubsky, the son of the Grand Prince of Vladimir Suzdal and inheritor of a large princedom in the heartland of Russia. Well, at least Yuri would have inherited this if his father was not murdered in his sleep ten years ago. Yuri had tried and failed to retake his land and could now be found in the Kingdom of Georgia, living among the semi-nomadic Kipchak Turks who have long been closely associated with Georgia. He was chosen by the nobles as he was a young, experienced commander and warrior. He was also a direct descendant of Rorik, a Norse Viking whose family had ruled large parts of Russia for the past 350 years. The two would marry and rule Georgia together. Yuri fulfilled his new role as general, heading successful Georgian raiding armies that would harass the Rum Sultanate as well as the Azerbaijani Atabegs in the east. While he was a proficient leader of men on the battlefield, he was not a good man to morally follow. He made it a habit to drink himself into fits of rage, where he would angrily scream at Tamar, sometimes even physically abusing her. Tamar would rise above him, and thankfully her nobles agreed with her that Yuri was a dangerous and unstable man. And in 1187, Tamar divorced Yuri and sent him back into his briefly interrupted exile. Finally, with that Rurik monster gone, Tamar would now need to find a new general and a new husband to lead her people. This time, Tamar would get to pick who she would marry, and chose a lifelong friend whose name was Soslin, who took the name David after marrying Tamar. He was a prince and a distant cousin from Tamar's matrilineal Allen royal family. In a time when queens couldn't rule over men, she ruled, and in a time where you marry for power, she married for love. There is one objection to this marriage. Yuri had come back, and leading an army that even included Tamar's aunt, that intended to make Yuri a king once again. 
With help from some displeased Georgian nobles, Yuriv was able to capture much of western Georgia. To defeat this Rus prince would be David Soslin, defending his wife and her kingdom from the exiled Yuri. David would defeat Yuri in the same year of his rebellion. He had brought Tamar's first husband to Tamar for punishment, but was surprised when Tamar simply pardoned him and let him be a free man. This would prove to be a mistake when a year later in 1193, Yuri would once again revolt against Tamar. This time, he started in the northeastern section of Georgia, capturing the province of Kakheti. David would once again crush Yuri, and when he was brought to Tamar, she decided to imprison him for the rest of his life. Finally, with a reliable king consort in the form of David, it would be time to start conquering. First was to deal with the Azerbaijani tribes, which emerged as a successor state of the Seljuk Empire. And in 1195, led by their Atabeg, Abu Bakr, the Azerbaijani army decided to make their stand at Shamkar Fortress. Shamkar Fortress would fall with ease, and David's army would chase the retreating army all the way back to the city of Ganja which surrendered the city to David upon his arrival. Next would be to free the Armenians, who had fallen under the rule of Islamic rulers some years ago. The Georgians and Armenians had always had close ties, and now it was time to help their conquered neighbors. Starting in 1196, this liberation began with the capture of Amberd Castle. Georgian generals would continue capturing forts until the ruler of these lands, Suli Mansa II of the Rum Sultanate, gathered an army in 1203 to retake his lost Armenian lands. Suli Mansa crossed into Georgian lands and made camp somewhere in the Bastani Valley. The Georgian army responded by attacking their campsite and fighting the unprepared Rum Sultan. After the Georgians took the Rum army banner, the Rum retreated back to their Anatolian Sultanate. The Georgian army returned to Tamar, where she would praise them from her balcony, honoring the living and the dead of the battle. The army would soon return to campaigning and eventually capture the key city of Kars. Another kingdom saw the weaknesses of the Islamic Caucasus emirs, and the Ayyubid Sultanate of Egypt took over eastern Anatolia and created a border with Georgia. The Georgian response was to besiege the Ayyubid fort of Allah in 1209 and contest the Ayyubid control over the Armenian lands. The siege was met by a massive Ayyubid army that would meet the besiegers outside of Fort Alat. Then a Georgian commander named Ivan was captured by the Ayyubids outside the fort, and this would force Georgia into negotiation. The Ayyubid Sultanate would agree to return Ivan, but only if Georgia would agree to split the Armenian lands with them and hold a truce with them that would last for the next 30 years. After some deliberation, Tamar agreed to this and secured her southern border for the next three decades. A pretty good deal. This conquest had only just begun, as her generals continued conquering lands in Iran, as well as coastal territories on both the Caspian and Black Seas, reaching as far as the Crimean Peninsula in the west and to the Baku Peninsula in the east. This is the largest the Georgian kingdom would ever be, and now it was an empire, with Tamar as the empress. After being raised in exile in the Georgian court, two boys named Alexios and David were ready to retake their own empire. The two boys were the son of Manuel Komnenos, the deposed empire of the crumbling Byzantine Empire. Their mother was Rusidan, the sister of Tamar who had fled back to Georgia as her husband lost his empire and was blinded by his own enemies. Tamar made it one of her lifelong goals to restore Alexios and David to their throne. She then set out to take Trebizond, which remained as one of the last holdouts of the Byzantine Empire. Her experienced army easily kicked out the weak Byzantine army stationed there, and then in 1204, Tamar put her nephew on the newly formed throne of Trebizond, successfully creating a buffer state on her western border. This would conclude the conquest of Tamar, and is one of the reasons why she earned the title of Tamar the Great. Some of the other reasons why she is considered the Great are due to her domestic policies. It is said that during her reign, no one was tortured or punished violently for any crimes that they may have committed. She also created something of a welfare system, and nearly 10% of the total Georgian income would go towards the poor, helping them with housing and feeding. Tamar's contributions to religion were also significant, as she endorsed and protected many Christian monasteries inside and outside of Georgia. When the Ayyubid Sultanate conquered Israel from the Crusaders in 1187, it was Tamar that wrote to Sultan Saladin and instructed him not to loot the Monastery of the Cross that was ran mainly by Georgia. Georgian monks. In this, she was successful, and the Georgian Christians were allowed free passage to the monastery during and after the death of Tamar. Tamar's death would come in 1213. While she was discussing matters of the empire, she suddenly collapsed, went into a coma, and then died a few days later. She was then buried in Jalati Monastery, joining her family of past kings. At 53 years old, Tamar had saw Georgia into a golden age of prosperity, religion, and land acquisition. Her title as King of Georgia proved that any woman could rule any land, perhaps even better than any man could. Tamar truly deserves the title of the Great.